Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. You probably know by now, but you can find all our previous episodes on my YouTube channel, on Stitcher, on iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast or watch your podcast. You can do video, audio, whatever platform, but wherever you watch it, if you found benefit or enjoyed some of the content, please go by, leave a review for us. That helps us to reach more people. Um, Today, I have a friend who I have known for quite a while in many different circles and super excited about his new book. We're going to talk about his book his story and the power of genomic testing. I think this is one of the most powerful things that we can do in our functional practices um, in the new era of artificial intelligence and just even knowing our individuality because so many times there's never a one size fits all. And I've been one of the biggest advocates in functional medicine. People are always like, Dr. Jill, what's your protocol for mold? What's your protocol? And I'm the one that's like, I don't do protocols. I just don't. (laughs) right? So it's the individual patient and and never is there a more important area of this than genetics because genetics are so individualized. And again, we're going to dive into that today. So thank you again for joining me, Kashif. It's a pleasure. And what you said is exactly, it's like, you know, this personalization that's removed from everything that we're doing, which is so easy to bring in if yeah. you know the tools to use, but you know, preaching to the choir. So totally. And we're going to talk about some of the cool tools that you have brought to the world. Let me just formally introduce you. Um, Kashif Khan is the chief executive officer and founder of the DNA company where personalized medicine is being pioneered through unique insights into the human genome. Growing up in Vancouver, Canada in an immigrant household, he developed an industrious entrepreneurial spirit from a young age. Prior to his tenure at the DNA company, he has advised a number of high growth startups in a variety of industries. As he dove into the field of functional genomics as a CEO of DNA Company, it was revealed that his neural wiring was actually genetically designed to be entrepreneurial. However, his genes also revealed a particular sensitivity to pollutants. I can relate to that. (laughs) Now seeing his health from the new lens, he dove further and started to see the genetic pathways that led to his own family's challenges and the opportunities to reverse chronic disease. So I always love when the story involves your experience, your, because you're clearly, you've done entrepreneurial stuff, you've led companies, but it got personal, didn't it? Yeah. So tell yeah, us your story. Is, yeah. You know, I, like you said, there's a lot of circles that were kind of floating around in, the, in this functional medicine world. And when you do that, all of the great stories seem to be rooted in somebody healing themselves, First of all, being failed. I forgot step one. Yeah. <laughs> being yeah. failed by some healthcare system, finding their own way, healing themselves, and then screaming from the rooftops, oh my God, my life has changed. Everyone needs to know. You know, and that's kind of what I went through, which is I wasn't even in the industry. I, I, I ran a marketing company. I, I helped startups grow. I helped them find out what they didn't even know they didn't know, mm-hmm. helped them develop themselves. We had a lot of success there. And then I got sick and mm-hmm. I had never been sick before. So all of a sudden at the age of 38, I had five chronic conditions all at once. Wow. And the question I would ask is why, what did I do wrong? Did I eat something wrong? Did I breathe something wrong? Just straight logic. And the answer I was getting, if I were to paraphrase, it's kind of like, we don't do that here. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's more like, we're going to tell you what you have and here's what pill you have to take. And let's just watch this and see how it goes. And that's what pushed me down this path of self-discovery, self-healing, learning that my own genome had a lot of support that it needed. And this is where some of my um, sort of some of my problems were solved by supporting broken genetic code that just wasn't instructing biological function properly. And therefore, I wasn't able to cope with the same thing that my colleagues and my friends and my family were able to. And that's what got me sick. And here I am in front of you. No conditions, no sickness. I don't even get a common cold anymore. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's where we got to. It really, I want to dive into so many topics. Let's start here though with your story because there's two things in your bio that you mentioned that I want to talk about. First of all, the entrepreneurial gene and what is, yeah. I'm assuming there's some dopamine involved here, but tell yes. us about um, this genetic tendency. I think I might have it too. <laughs> yeah. So it's more, I would call it more of a profile than a gene. Um, if you If you look at my neural map, it speaks to what we call warrior genetics, mm-hmm. meaning that I'm, I'm a highly reward-seeking individual and I'm wired for leadership. It's very hard for me to take direction, yeah. but it's very easy for me to see the plan and lay it out and have a team sort of get uh, on board to get it done. Mm-hmm. And why is that? Yes to dopamine. That's one of a few pieces. So the way I experience pleasure or reward and by the way, dopamine powers both. Ultimately, yes. Yes. satisfaction is what you're striving for and what drives us. 
but you can get it from one of two sources, pleasure, eating some tasty food or drinking or reward, achieving something at work. And you only need one of the two, by the way, to get that hit. So the DRD2 gene for me, it, it, I, it, I have the lowest possible density of receptors mm. or dopamine in my brain because of that gene. And so I'm not able to experience pleasure at the normal intensity level. And so whatever's going on, everyone's like, wow, this is great. And I'm like, it's not really what you're saying. It kind of sucks actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so that's one. Now the clearance, now the one thing is intensity. The other is duration. Yeah. I also have hyper fast clearance. So I'm feeling it at a very low level and it doesn't last long enough. So that could lead to depression, which by the way, I did experience at one point. It could lead to addiction, which by the way, I did experience at one point, or it could lead to achievement because you're only needing either pleasure or reward. And that's what I'm doing now, now that I understand myself. So that's one layer to it. I also am deleted for a portion of a gene that drives your adrenaline response, mm -hmm. which means I'm much more likely to imprint trauma and emotional stimulus because of my adrenaline response, mm -hmm. which makes, makes me somewhat more emotionally tuned in. You know, I literally, I'm, I'm full of trauma and PTSD. That's what I'm wired with now, but not necessarily meaning it's a burden. It speaks to EQ, being able to work with people, being able to, you know, relate, et cetera. And the last piece of this, I would say, is my serotonin response is completely dysregulated. And so I'm constantly annoyed, frustrated by every little detail of everything that's going on because my brain can't prioritize all of these incoming stimulus. If one person is like, blinders on getting my job done. For me, it's like, don't make that noise. Get out of the room. Uh -huh. I can't. But the converse of that is in my work. I see every little detail. And so it, that combination leads to this drive and sort of warrior mentality, which, you know, I was designed to do things and build things and build companies. So that's what I do now. I love it. And I love, I'm sure people listening can relate because we have a lot of doctors, entrepreneurs, and, you know, people like that on yeah. this podcast, but I love that you described the different pathways. I've recently read um, Ann Lepke's book on dopamine nation, and she does such a good right. job of describing it. And they actually used her in the social dilemma that, you know, big uh, yes. Netflix, uh, hit. And one of the things she talks about is exactly what you described this two, but the pathways with dopamine, one is all about addiction. And if you're not yeah. careful, it's highly addictive. And it's funny. Cause I always thought I have the same pathway and I thought, Oh, yeah. I don't have addictions until I realized work was my addiction. Right. Yes. Um, but then the other pathway makes someone like you or myself, um, you achieve because that gives you that reward and it can be very successful in society. Um, and you actually can delay gratification with that. So yes. you can actually delay that. And, but so interesting how you lay that out. So, um, so obviously you found this out. Now you also talked about environmental pollutants and your sensitivity. Yeah. Tell us more about that pathway. So there's multiple layers to look at, but the one that sort of screams out for me is a glutathione pathway. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple phases and you know this better than anyone to detoxification. There's phase one and then there's phase two, there's clearance. So my ability to deal with airborne toxins, mold, chemicals is not so bad. My gut, however, I, there's something in genetics which people aren't familiar with called a copy number variation. So we're often looking for what's called a SNP, meaning a, a, a spelling error in a gene, which means that it doesn't do its job efficiently. Uh, and there's also what's called an insertion or deletion, meaning that there's a paragraph that's, mis that's missing entirely, or there's an extra paragraph. So imagine the implication of the function of that gene. It's like you're reading a book and there's a whole paragraph missing. Or there's something called a copy number variation. You don't even have the gene, yeah. never got it from mom or dad, or you have an extra copy. So imagine the implication on your biology of that. So when it comes to the gut, the GSTM1, this is one of the genes where it's possible to have a copy number variation. It's not possible with all genes, by the way. And it's a primary first line of defense for the gut. Yeah. And so when it came to me eating what I was eating downtown, and when I say environmental, it's also like the packaging. It's yeah. the drying agents used to dry food. It's the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, solvents and everything that's involved, the heavy metals that the foods are processed on, the cleaning that chemicals that are used on those heavy metals. My gut has zero ability to prevent any of that from entering my bloodstream. It just gets in, causes inflammation. So I had leaky gut. I had gut dysbiosis. I had a, an inflammatory tract uh, was leading to leaky brain and brain fog. You know, all of this stuff was a sort of a cascade. So that's one piece of it, but there's multiple pieces we can talk about. There's also methylation, which is now that we know 
how I'm dealing with toxins, the ensuing inflammation that's caused, how efficiently do you deal with that? And I did it horribly. Yeah. And methylation has two components, actually methylating things like breaking them down and making them water soluble, which I don't do so well. And then the actual removal, there's a gene called COMP, which is a, the tail end of methylation that helps you remove things, including hormones and neurochemicals, lots of stuff. So a combination of these, again, starts to paint a picture of a profile mm -hmm. and you drop me in downtown Toronto where I was working every day, breathing things in, eating things, not sleeping properly, all of these things. Yeah, there's no wonder I had five chronic conditions. My body was so burdened at the cellular level by all this nonsense that it couldn't thrive anymore. It was barely surviving, in fact. Wow. And are you a comp, uh, homozygous for the two mutations or? Yeah. So I'm not doing the best. <laughs> oh, sorry. My, my comp is actually, sorry, I'm thinking of methylation. Like my comp is actually very quick and efficient. It's the methylation okay. and precursor to that. That's not doing well. Got it. Right. Okay. My comp's here like, Hey, let's get rid of everything with yeah. nothing to remove. Right. No, nobody packed up the garbage to get right, rid of. Right. So that's kind of what's going on for me. Okay. Very good. And obviously it led to, so then how did you get from there, from where you were not feeling well, not really knowing the genetic and personalized component to discovering yeah. the genetics and then uh, creating the company, the DNA company? Tell us how that happened. Yeah. So I, you know, I first, um, I first learned that I didn't under, even understand what the genetic tool was for. Mm -hmm. And the people that were providing me the data and the reports and the science also didn't really understand what it was for. They thought they knew, right. and they were telling me things like, you have an 80% chance of this, you have a 30% chance of this. I was like, you just took my genetics, my human instruction manual, which instructs every one of my cells on how to do their jobs, and we're only getting to 80%. How are we not certain? With This is my, my human code. Right. And we're still at 80 because they're looking at things where the, the data is built disease-centric. Yes. You know? You have an 80% chance of Alzheimer's because we've seen that 80% of people with Alzheimer's get this gene mm -hmm. variant, but we still didn't ask, why did they get the Alzheimer's? This gene is responsible for putting cholesterol into the brain to reduce the inflammation. None of that tells us why you got the inflammation to begin with. So step one for me was learning that genetics was this phenomenal and wonderful tool, but it wasn't being used properly because the research was being funded by trying to work with disease as opposed to systems. Then it was, this stuff is too hard to use. You know, unless I had a PhD sitting in front of me, it was a different language that made no sense. And so those were the two missions. How do I take all of this? Especially when we go back to RSIDs, right? In the literature, there's these RSIDs that are numbers and they have no meaning. Yes. Even when we talk about the GST P1 or GSM1 or MTHFR, you and I yeah. kind of know what it means. And there's more of a language around that. Even then yeah. it's complicated because there might be 20 variants. So I, I just want to frame this because I know patients who are in, in, into this know as well as we do. And I love this is what you've done with your company is take the complexity out of it. So yeah. keep, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just, it's so. No, important. no, you're right on because what I learned is that there's a ton, ton, ton of data. Mm -hmm. And what I also learned is that data is dumb. It is useless unless you know what question to ask. The insights are what are valuable. And so what we did, again, thinking as an entrepreneur coming in, trying to solve the problem as opposed to academically being told, here's how you do things, right? I said, well, what's missing here is we already know what the genes do. Clinicians in the functional space are really good at understanding the conditions at the root cause, like yourself and understanding environmental health. If we could put those two things together, that's kind of what's been missing. So we set up a clinic and we spent three years with 7,000 patients. Wow. One by one by one by one by one, anecdotally solving their problems to get to the 100% every single time. Mm -hmm. And then we would learn something and put it in the inside bucket. And we would learn something and, put it, and we just kept learning and learning. And we got to the point where we really re truly understood how to use the genomic map as a compass mm -hmm. for why two of the exact same genomic maps and two different people, one got sick and one didn't. The difference was their environment, nutrition, and lifestyle. So you have to be able to understand here's the genome which is not supposed to tell you that you have a risk of disease. It's supposed to tell you there's a certain biological function that is off. Yes. Or maybe it's a little too good. Right. Right. That's all you should be doing with this tool is how am I making hormones, making neurochemicals, clearing toxins, et cetera, et cetera. Understand the biological function. Then you understand if I paired that with my habits, mm -hmm. environment, nutrition, and lifestyle, that equals conditions or it equals living to 120 with no conditions. Yeah. But you now know exactly what to do. And that's kind of where we got to. 
Yeah, and what's new? Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. We got to. Yeah, and what's neat is I've seen from the very inception, I think it was like a year yeah. or two you came out. I think I did some of the testing on myself. And what I love, and it has come such a long way from them. Like the, the kind of data that you have now, even from when I first saw it is unbelievable, which is why I love what you do and having you here. Because even a patient, granted, we want the physician to kind of weigh in, but even yeah. a patient without a physician, which we have direct, you can order these directly as a consumer. Is that correct? For sure. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you can get some information. And what I was going to say is what I remember way back in the beginning was like hormone pathways and all of our hormones yeah. down certain pathways from cholesterol to pregnenolone to either DHA or testosterone or estradiol. And what I yeah. saw on the way you framed it was stops and goes and like, this is slower, yes. this is faster. And it was literally within five minutes of looking at that report. It's like, oh, no wonder. Cause I knew what my hormones tended to be. I had breast cancer at 25 and I started to look at the patterns and the way you as an entrepreneurial mind took this medical data that I've known for years. Right. But the <laughs> way you put it into a report that was really legible and readable and understandable, it was really well done. And that was your first iteration. Now, like I said, it's a way tell me just cause I'm not even sure that I know from that very first, some of those pathways, where have you gone and what kind of testing do you now have available? Yes. Yeah, so the genetics, first of all, yeah, that's some nostalgia right there because that yeah, was, I know. Those, were, <laughs> that, those were our research reports, uh -huh. which even then still needed some interpretation and guidance. But of course, they were far better than what was out there, right? Yeah. So what we've done was we, our intention is how do I hand somebody who's never even seen the word genetics before mm -hmm. and hand them something where like they get it and they can take action immediately. They know what to do. It should be as simple as here's what's wrong and here's how you fix it. That's it. That's all I need to know, right? Science is there. Great. I can trust it, but this, tell me this. And so we kind of built the tool that I wished I had when I was sick that didn't exist, right? So kind of reverse engineered. I wish this was like this. And if I could, you know, it would have made it so much easier. So first of all, people don't need a report. They need to know for a problem like anxiety, like, should I be on the keto diet? Like estrogen toxins? Yeah. What is my body doing? Mm -hmm. right i don't need to know the drd2 gene which we talked about earlier for dopamine i need to know addiction red flag and here's why and here's the supplements you take here's the habits to adopt right we might tell that person focus on reward instead right so now we can understand them right so that's the reports are laid out more in problems but even then the i what another piece that i wished i had piece one is tell me about the problems not about the genes piece two i wish i had is now that i know this teach me a little bit so that I can not be fed a fish, but learn how to fish. I, I want to be able to use this tool because guess what? Your DNA doesn't change. Yeah. So once you get this data, I want to be able to go back to it with whatever next problem I'm facing, you know, I'm going from puberty to fertility to menopause. Those are three different realities that have three different sets of problems to solve, but your DNA hasn't changed. So if I had this test, I should be able to use it for the rest of my life. So in that we created what we call a gene cast which is this personalized podcast driven by AI that reads your results to you and tells you what each gene is so that you can then use that as a tool and apply it to whatever you're working on, right? The third thing that I've realized people need is we need to have a contextual shift in terms of how we think about problems. So we've added a bunch of video to teach you before you start working on this stuff, you may not even understand the problem properly. And we need to, now that we understand the human body the way we do, we're going to take you to rethink. And as an example, when it comes to cardiovascular health, we don't think of cardiovascular health as a heart disease. We think of it as an artery disease. It's yeah. an arterial inflammation disease. Yes. 
And yes, and, and we All don't about believe... the endothelium. I keep preaching it's, that I could not agree exactly. more. Exactly. <laughs> it is yeah. an endothelial disease. That's what it is. The heart will keep going till the very last second until you abuse yourself so bad that the heart is hard suffocating from blood and ticker stops ticking, right? Meanwhile, what we need to know is what's the quality of my endothelium genetically predetermined, the, like, the resilience capacity to inflammation, what toxins would cause me inflammation, how well do I transport lipids and cholesterol, why would it build up, how do I deal with oxidation, which then actually oxidizes the cholesterol and causes it to build up and get me into a, something that we call cholesterolemia. You know, so if you start to understand the root, uh, we're reteaching or teaching you how to rethink the problem so that you also look at the solutions differently. It's no longer about heart disease. It's more like I should never have inflammation in my endothelium, right? So that, that's another big layer that I wished I had in the beginning, which is now part of the whole reporting system. Love it. Like, for example, do you produce nitric oxide or do you not oxidize yes. LDL or those kinds of things, which again, I couldn't be exactly. a bigger fan because you and I know cholesterol itself is inert. It's not the damaging thing. It's when it's oxidized by the... Yes stress EMFs, the chemicals, the toxins, the bad diet, the lack of sleep, the stress levels. Um, and then same way with like cortisol, you, cortisol is not a bad thing, but if you overproduce it or underproduce it, those can lead to uh, conditions. Exactly. As well. you did, and there's a, plenty of evidence out there. If you look at, for example, Switzerland has the highest per capita cholesterol numbers in the, in the EU, yeah. but they also have the lowest level of heart disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. because they're healthy they're not toxic they, they yeah. have they eat all this cheese and fat all the time so it's, they have plenty floating around in their blood but it's not hard they, they're not inflamed yeah and they don't have free radical activity in the blood oxidizing the cholesterol yeah they're yeah. fine right Absolutely. They, so the, you have to think about it contextually correct yeah and just to reiterate because if you're listening you're like wait my, my doctor says first of all highest the best state of mortality as far as the least, least risk of death was found for cholesterol levels 200 to 220. Mm. Not 140, not some of these yeah. really low levels because we need cholesterol to make the hormones in our body and help our yes. brains. And like what you just said, just to reiterate, it's not the cholesterol itself. It's the damage to cholesterol, which is oxidation. So reactive oxygen from our environment, from our food, from all the things that we do that abuse our bodies yeah. can create oxidative stress, damage the cholesterol. And then it's a sticky lining of the endothelium that gets damaged or there's not enough nitric oxide. And you're looking at genetics around what is your predisposition towards yeah. endothelial damage, lack of nitric oxide, oxidized LDL, or even plaque for the like APOE. Uh, exactly. Staff, right. Yeah, exactly. We have these people that are their APOE gene is not functioning properly. So their baseline is just higher. Yes. Yes. Even and if there's no They may want to decrease their uh, saturated fat intake, that small percentage of APOE 4. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, so you created, and again, like I said, I think from when I first started, you've got what kinds of panels and things do you have to offer? Yeah. So we, you know, this is again, going back to my journey. I hate to sound selfish, but it's more like the, re the way I healed myself took me through this journey of now understanding what people need. There's 22,000 genes in the mm -hmm. human genome. We don't really know what we need out of that, right? That's why what I'm trying to do is curate it down to what is highly actionable and solves most problems, chronic disease, aging, and performance today, libido, energy, et cetera. So what, what genes are important? It's the functional genes, the systems and pathways, not the my ear is connected to my head, or I have a crow's nest, or I have what all this kind of stuff. We don't need to know. We need to know how do my hormones function, et cetera. So the, the six big systems we look at are everything about mood and behavior. How do you make neurochemicals? How do you bind them? How do you clear them? And you can then start to predict exactly how you behave, how you react, how you perceive to make yourself mentally healthy. Because we find a big chunk of healing happens here, including myself, because I'm serotonin dysregulated. And because I have this reward seeking behavior, I burn myself out. I try too hard. I'm over compliant. I'll take too many supplements, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll overdo it. And that was hurting me. I, I, I also overthink it, which also hurts me, right? So that's what, a big one, mood and behavior. Second is diet and nutrition. Should I be keto? Should I be vegan? Do carbs matter? Vitamin D, C, how do I do all of these little jobs? Very clear. The genes that instruct each one of these are very, so if I take the vegan example, you need very specific enzymes to break down chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and the genes that do that job are very clear. So if you're not doing well there, which by the way, most people aren't, then you're not going to do well as a vegan longitudinally. You might feel good in the first few weeks, but if you can't 
your gut cannot uh, actually produce the enzymes to make that food digestible, you're going to struggle, right? So, so that's another one. Third one is everything around sleep. And this is a big area, which again, I know you, you speak a lot about and every functional medicine practitioner think, talks about if you're not sleeping properly, you know, forget about everything else. Yeah. That's your recovery. That's when you're healing. You need to fix that. And so we figure out what is blocking someone from having an efficient circadian rhythm and clock, from being able to not wake up at three in the morning, from being able to sleep through the night and actually feel rested, get that deep, high quality sleep, multiple different problems to solve and we can solve all of them. Uh, three more systems. One is everything around chronic disease, you know, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular. So the way we just talked about reframing cardiovascular disease, we looked at all major conditions like that. And the next one, number five, is everything around innate health of the cell. So de detoxification, inflammation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, glucuronidation, antioxidation, all these things that are a load on our cellular health, which ultimately speed up our aging. The intention here is how do we slow aging down, which is what I've done for myself. Yeah. The last one, of course, hormones, you know, another sleeper in terms of your average allopathic healthcare plan is, yeah. or hormones are ignored when they're so implicit in every problem we're dealing with, especially when it comes to women's health. And the last thing I'll say is we then take all of this and reinterpret it for the context of longevity. Mm -hmm. How do I take all of what I just learned? and use this to add 10, 15, 20 years to my life that I maybe wouldn't have had if I had the wrong habits. And the funny thing is with, with the book that we were talking about earlier, I literally wrote it as this, my seven systems and who, who I am, what I had to change, what habits I adopted, what habits I removed. And it's literally laying out, here's how I did it. And now you can start to see yourself in the story and do it for yourself. So I love that. I just, we both talked about our books this spring were published and same thing yeah. was like the story is it's not really about you or me technically, but it gives a platform for other people to see themselves as a reflection in our journeys. And yes. very, very similar. I was like, it's really not about me. It's not really about you. It's about you showing the world and showing the people who can use this genetic testing what's possible for them, right? Exactly. Yeah. the listeners and same with me i totally uh totally understand um you guys have created a landing page for clients and patients of, of me um so if you're listening now i want to say this we'll say it again but you can actually go to dr jill dot dna dot clinic and order your own test directly without a physician order so go check it out for sure and again we'll give the website for your book too i want to talk a little bit more about your book but if you are just joining us and are like i kind of want to do this you actually can get this directly from the dna company right yeah, for sure. And that was one of our intentions was we removed some of the diagnostic stuff that makes it difficult for the consumer to access, yeah. which really don't need anyway. It was how do we focus on the big problems, chronic disease, aging, and because of the way we designed it as an educational tool, you can access it directly. Yeah. And I've ordered it from a patient. So if you're a patient of mine, you can get this ordered. I can help you. But again, the way you have done it is so uh, user-friendly. So if you are interested, Dr. Jill, no spaces, no underline, dot DNA, dot clinic, you can get your own test there. So we talked a little bit about your story. We jumped into the testing that you've done, but now you've got this book out and it sounds like it's <laughs> your journey. I want to make sure people know about that and get a copy if they want as well. But anything else that we haven't talked about with your book, that was it just May it was released? It was just this past May. And for me, I mean, you know this very well. We we're talking about May, but the book started a year and a half ago. Yes, right? yes. It's been a long journey. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so a year and a half ago, you know, when and this is when we met sometime before that, actually. And at the time we met you, we were still a research company. We weren't really a testing company per se. Yes, we had tests because that's what was our research tool. Yeah. But the intention was to learn and document these insights and then work with partners. We became a testing company because of my niece who sort of had a mental health uh, crisis, yeah. which based on her genome, I realized was not at all a mental health crisis. It was actually a hormone issue. Mm -hmm. It was a hormone, vitamin D and dopamine issue, which was being labeled as anxiety for which she was being prescribed a pill, wow. you know, to the point where she ran away from home. Oh. Uh, and, and what I really learned is that she just didn't make hormones properly. And this happened during peak COVID in Toronto, where we had the world's longest lockdown. Yeah. And she was in this, in the middle of winter, she hadn't been outside in like five months and she had got zero vitamin D and her, the genetics of her vitamin D cascade are the worst possible. The so BDR always, probably right. No. Yeah. BDR also the SIP, I think it's two R one, which converts the D two into D three. 
Yep. And then in between VDR and that, there's a gene that transports. So the three steps to vitamin D metabolism genetically, take the, take the D2, turn it into D3. Then there's a, that's one gene. Second gene then transports it to the cell. Then there's the VDR, which then binds it at the cell. And all three, she had the worst possible version. So she needs a heavy, heavy dose of vitamin D. So three months of anxiety attacks, like clockwork at the very beginning of our cycle, she was being prescribed a pill. And when I realized it was happening at the beginning of her cycle, I looked at her hormones, yes. looked at other things, vitamin D, looked at her dopamine pathway, which is just like mine, slim to none. And I realized it was a vitamin D problem that was layered on top of her hormone problem. But it happened now because of her context, remember environment, nutrition, yeah. lifestyle, yeah. hadn't been outside. Nobody. So we fixed it, fixed it the very next month. She has never had this problem again. It's been two years. She would have probably still been on medication today if I didn't know this. Yeah. And that's what launched me from, wow, this is not a research tool. This is that something that everybody needs. And so one of our patients was actually the founder of this publishing company. And so I said, here's what's going on. The world needs to know this story. You know, and at that time, I didn't know what kind of tests we were going to have in 2023. I just knew that there was information that needed to get that out there. And he said, yeah, let's write this book. Let's do it. Love and it. so I started writing. Love it. Love it. I love in so many ways that you've taken your entrepreneurial and your genetics and kind of optimized in the best way to help the world, to help my patients, my listeners, and everyone out there. And I really love that we ended here with your niece's story and on mental health, because I have long said, I don't know if it is, it's rare that there's a pure depression without a cause, right? Whether yeah. it's a mold uh, insult or toxic insult, whether it's genetics, whether it's hormones, whether it's, there's so many reasons why our brain, and we always think of like, we put that in the bucket of psychiatry and, yeah. um, and we put it in this like, okay. And then we use some drugs, which are perfectly appropriate to stabilize or to treat. But so often yeah. I would say maybe 90% of the time, just like your niece, I will find a very clear root cause and yes. treat that root cause and get patients off their medication. They feel amazing, whether it's depression, over, bipolar. Yeah, over and over and over again, same story on this side, over and over again, the best depression medication only works 40% of the time. The very best possible one that we have available today, something like walking, exercising, works twice as efficiently this is this is published science this is not right. just a red <laughs> number this is actual numbers right so we know that it's there's a causation you weren't born depressed mm -hmm. you weren't depressed when you were 11 12 13 what happened something changed yep. so you got to do that detective work and working with someone with your brilliance is a blessing to do that reverse engineering but there we always seem to find a cause you know and, and when you find that cause all of a sudden you're able to reverse instead of treat Love it. Love the work you're doing for the world. What is, what's one takeaway? We've gotten so many pearls today that you'd like to leave your list, our listeners today with. Well, I, I mean, if you take me, for example, you know, when I started this journey, when I had five chronic conditions, couldn't get out of bed. Uh, I was 38 years old, biologically 43, right? So I, I learned about biological age testing when I started to figure out like, how do I fix this myself? And so I was 43, five years older than myself. I now actually am 43. It's been five years since that day that I got sick and collapsed. And my biological age is now 33, Easy. right? So I've been able to, there's one thing, how do I solve my problem? Where there's one thing to, how do I become the best version of myself? Then all the way to the, how do I reverse time? And literally get 10 years back that I screwed up and made some mistakes, but now I had that time back to start over again. You know, um, and so that's what potential is. If you look at the innate physical structure of DNA and the telomeres, the caps that are designed to protect your DNA, it looks like it's designed to last 120 years. So my belief is we are here with 120 years of life and it's the choices that we make that take lives years away, right? Mm -hmm. So if we did everything right and we always made the right choice, 120 dancing at a wedding should be your reality, right? Right. You should die of old age. But what we do and why our life expectancy is now 75, I think in the US is because of the choices we make, the foods we eat, et cetera, et cetera. So just start making right choices. Your DNA will help inform amongst other things that can help you and know that that is optional. It is a choice to get to that or not get to that. And data is power, which is what the DNA company is doing. If you wanna read um, your book, it's the dnaway.com, right? Right. Yes. And then if you want to get your own test, you can go to drjill.dna.clinic, order your own test. And I'm such a fan of patients getting data like this. 
which is yeah. wonderful. I love what you're doing. Thank you for taking your journey and making it such a powerful uh, story to help the world and then taking your entrepreneurial spirit and creating the DNA company. And like I said, I've seen you all the way from the very beginning. Yeah. And what you've done is really amazing. So thanks again for coming on today. It's a pleasure, Jill. Thank you so much. You're welcome.